Wir starten gleich, wir werden auch einen Livestream haben, wenn dann vielleicht sogar mehr Personen haben, als wir hier vor Ort sind und auf die warten wir jetzt noch. Also. Ah, gut, ja. Ja, sehr geehrter Herr Professor Fram, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren der Stiftung Werner von Siemensring und des Stiftungsrats, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ich darf Sie ganz herzlich im Namen des Stiftungsrats Werner von Siemensring hier in dieser ersten sozusagen Post-Corona-Veranstaltung der Stiftung begrüßen. Ich bin die neue Präsidentin der Physikalisch-Technischen Bundesanstalt seit 1. Mai. Und dabei darf ich auch gleichzeitig Vorsitzende des Rats der Stiftung sein. Und dabei gehört es auch zu meinen wunderschönen Aufgaben, Veranstaltungen wie diese hier zu moderieren, nämlich die Auszeichnung von Ihnen heute, liebe junge Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftler. Es freut mich, dass also dieser schöne Anlass der ersten Veranstaltung in Präsenz nach einer ziemlich endlosen Zeit virtueller Veranstaltung eine ist, die gerade Ihnen als, ja, jungen Menschen gilt und die Ehrung von Ihnen. Wir sind aber noch nicht ganz aus den Fängen der Pandemie befreit, sodass ich jetzt auch alle Zuhörerinnen und Zuhörer im Stream begrüße, die heute nicht in Präsenz dabei sein können. Ich hoffe, es gelingt uns in dieser hybriden Form, Sie auch adäquat einschließen zu können und freue mich, dass Sie auch dabei sind. Ja, jetzt möchte ich aber erstmal Sie, liebe jungen Wissenschaftlerinnen und jungen Wissenschaftler, wie Sie hier in der Stiftung heißen, mit großer Freude begrüßen. Heute würdigen wir Sie und Ihre herausragenden, hochaktuellen und zukunftsweisen Themen zwischen naturwissenschaftlicher Forschung und technologischer Anwendung. Ich glaube, Sie könnten alle dem Motto von Werner von Siemens zu Ihren preiswürdigen Ergebnissen zustimmen. In dem ich will, liegt eine mächtige Zauberkraft, wenn es ernst damit ist und Tatkraft dahinter steht. Und das war bestimmt bei Ihnen auch so. Seien Sie herzlich willkommen zu diesem Kolloquium. Es geht heute um Sie und Ihre herausragende Leistung, also lassen Sie sich auch gut feiern. Mein Dank gilt natürlich auch den Gastgebern der heutigen Veranstaltung, dem Max-Planck-Institut für multidisziplinäre Naturwissenschaften, das uns heute so freundlich beheimatet und das Sie auch schon in der Führung vor Beginn der Veranstaltung kennenlernen konnten. Zunächst einmal scheint der Name des Instituts ganz interessant, denn viele von uns forschen wahrscheinlich zwischen naturwissenschaftlichen Disziplinen, da dort heute die wichtigsten Innovationen entstehen. Also ein bisschen sind wir alle ein Institut oder zugehörig zu multidisziplinären Naturwissenschaften. Aber, das haben Sie vielleicht bei der Führung erfahren, ist dieser Name ja eine Besonderheit. Es ist ja ein recht junges Institut in dieser Form, denn es ist erst zu Beginn des Jahres fusioniert aus zwei relativ wichtigen und auch sehr bekannten Einrichtung, nämlich dem Max-Planck-Institut für Biophysikalische Chemie und dem Max-Planck-Institut für Experimentelle Medizin. Ich habe den Eindruck, es entsteht damit ein so breites Forschungsspektrum, dass Physik, Chemie, Strukturzellbiologie, Neurowissenschaften, biomedizinische Forschung, alles in einem Portfolio vereint. Und das ist wirklich beeindruckend, was da jetzt entstanden ist. Und das schlägt den Bogen von Grundlagenforschung zu vielen Biochemie und physikmedizinischen Fragen bis hin zu angewandter transnationaler Forschung und Anwendung ist eben auch das Stichwort für unsere Ehrung heute. Also ich gratuliere dem MPE nochmal ganz herzlich für den Start in eine neue Ära multidisziplinärer und angewandter Forschung und denke, Sie können damit die neuen großen und brennenden Fragen in diesem Themengebiet gut adressieren. Und es ist ein ausgezeichneter Ort für unsere Preisverleihung, dass er genau auch diese Themen adressiert. Ja, also das Institut ist ein wunderbarer Gastgeber, aber, das ist vielleicht nicht allen bekannt, auch ein Ort, der mit seinen herausragenden Leistungen in technischer Anwendung immer wieder hochkarätige Preisträgerinnen und Preisträger hervorbringt. Das ist auch für die Stiftung Werner von Siemensring von Bedeutung, denn Herr Professor Fram, der hier anwesend ist, hat im Jahr 2020, also bei der letztjährigen, der zweijährigen Preisvergaben des Werner von Siemensring, einen Preis erhalten, nämlich für die Erfindung der medizinischen Magnetresonanztomographie. Dieser Preis gilt auch sozusagen als der herausragende Technikpreis in Deutschland. Man nennt es auch manchmal den Nobelpreis der Technik. Und dieser darf bei Ihrer Erfindung, Herr Frahm, ganz zu Recht so genannt werden. Für diejenigen, die jetzt aus den Familien kommen, Sie kennen alle das Verfahren der Magnetresonanztomographie. 
als mächtiges bildgebendes und vollkommen schmerzloses Instrument aus Arztpraxis und Krankenhäusern. Es hat also hier in der Arbeitsgruppe von Herrn Frahm in Göttingen seine Wiege und hat von dort den Siegeszug in alle Welt angegangen. Also, die sind hier in der Wiege der Magnetresonanztomographie. Ja, lassen Sie mich vielleicht die Gelegenheit nutzen, etwas über die Stiftung Werner von Siemens Ring zu berichten. Die Stiftung wurde zum 100-jährigen Geburtstag von Werner von Siemens gegründet. Kann man mal überlegen, das war am 13. Dezember 1916. Deshalb übrigens wird der Ring auch immer im Dezember eigentlich genau zu diesem Datum verliehen. Die Gründungsmitglieder dieser Stiftung, das waren sehr illustre Persönlichkeiten, zum Beispiel Adolf von Harnack, in die Naturwissenschaft weniger bekannt, ein Theologe, der nicht nur die Wissenschaft stärken wollte, sondern auch sich beteiligt hat an der Gründung der Kaiser-Wilhelm-Gesellschaft, Vorreiter der max planck institute und sich auch für den Zugang von Frauen und vielen anderen Personen zu Universitäten einsetzt. Walter Rathenau, den kennt man heute mehr aus den politischen Aktivitäten und seiner wirtschaftspolitischen Haltung, aber zu dieser Zeit hat ihn die Elektrochemie umgetrieben und in der von ihm geleiteten AEG hat er sich um die Zukunft der Elektrizität gekümmert. Emil Warburg, ein Physiker, der nicht nur wegweisenden Elektromagnetismus verstanden hat, sondern war auch Präsident meines Forschungsinstituts, instituts der Physikalisch-Technischen Reichsanstalt, PTR. Dann Ferdinand Graf von Zeppelin, den kennen Sie wahrscheinlich als Erfinder des entsprechenden Luftschiffs und Walter Nerns, noch ein Nobelpreisträger, der auch mit der Elektrochemie und Thermochemie hochbekannt ist. Er ist übrigens danach, nach Emil Warburg, auch Präsident der PDR gewesen. Und dann gab es eine ganze Reihe von Stiftern, die diese Stiftung auch mit begleitet haben. Kaiser Wilhelm II., Ludwig III., König von Bayern und auch ein paar Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftler, die ganz bekannt sind, zum Beispiel Georg Quinke, der an meiner früheren Alma Mater der Universität Münster gearbeitet hat, William Conrad Röntgen, der dann in Würzburg die Strahlen entdeckt hat, die nach ihm benannt wurden, aber auch führende Unternehmen und Industrielle. Also vor 100 Jahren schon und heute noch immer ist es ein dynamischer, engagierter Kreis von bekannten Persönlichkeiten, die in der Stiftung sich engagieren, um den Weg von der Grundlagenforschung zur technologischen Anwendung, sozusagen den Technologietransfer auch zu fördern. Das ist auch die Hauptaufgabe der Stiftung, sozusagen Technikerrungenschaften und Technikforschung zu fördern. Und das macht sie durch zwei maßgebliche Auszeichnungen. Das erste, hatte ich gerade schon erwähnt, ist die Auszeichnung der Lebensleistung. Oft wird es als wichtiger Stiftungszweck genannt. Das ist die Verleihung des Werner von Siemens Rings alle zwei Jahre seit der Gründung. Und ähm, dabei gilt die Leitlinie von Werner von Siemens. Der Wert einer Erfindung liegt in ihrer praktischen Durchführung. Warum ist dieser Preis so besonders bekannt? Das liegt nicht nur an der Besonderheit, dass die Preisträgerinnen und Preisträger tatsächlich einen Ring als Preis erhalten, der sie in dem Design und an der Erfindung und an der technischen Innovation anlehnt und von namhaften Schmuckdesignerinnen oder Designern in einem Wettbewerb realisiert worden. Und es liegt auch an den illustren Preisträgerinnen und Preisträgern. Übrigens, wenn Sie mal wissen wollen, wie so ein Ring aussieht, können Sie Herrn Frahm fragen, dessen Ring auch nachgebildet wurde, seine Erfindung in einer Schatulle, die der Magnetresonanzgeräten nicht unähnlich sieht. Ja, wer sind denn die Preisträgerinnen und Preisträger aus der Technikgeschichte? Das liest sich schon ein bisschen wie das Who is Who der Technikerfindung. Karl von Linde, der eine Kältemaschine zur Abkühlung von Gasen entwickelt hat. Er könnte heute als Erfinder der Kühlschränke bezeichnet werden. Er hat den ersten Preis 1916 erhalten. Karl Bosch, Hugo Junkers, Walter Schottky, der Erfinder der Dioden, Werner von Braun, Evelyn Gottsein, vielleicht weniger bekannt, hat aber die Magnetschwebebahn entwickelt, Bertolt Leibinger hat Laser für Materialverarbeitung entwickelt, Manfred Fuchs für die Satellitentechnik und viele weitere. Ja, und auch in diesem Jahr sind die Preisträgerinnen 2022, die natürlich den Preis erst im Dezember bekommen, illustre Personen, die sich in diese Reihe nahtlos einreihen. Aus diesem Institut hier wird Herr Stefan Hell, den ich glaube, ich jetzt nicht im Publikum sehe, deshalb von Ferner, herzlichen Glückwunsch, den Preis für die technologische Weiterentwicklung seiner bekannten Nanoskopie erhalten und damit erneut ein Preisträger aus diesem Institut. Und erstmals seit vielen Jahren erhält ein Team einen Preis, und zwar das Team 
Hugo Sein, Özlem Türeci, Christoph Huber und Katharina Kariko. Und die Namen haben Sie sicher in den letzten zwei Jahren sehr gerne gehört, denn das sind die Entwicklerinnen und Entwickler des Impfstoffs von BioNTech. Und die haben für die uns alle so lebenswichtige und rettende Erfindung und Produktion effektiver mrna basierter Wirkstoffe realisiert. Das sind alles sehr wichtige technologische Erfindungen und wir freuen uns, dass wir diese dann auch im Dezember wieder verleihen können. Die zweite vornehme Aufgabe der Stiftung ist eben die Förderung von jungen Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftlern mit dem Ziel. Und jetzt zitiere ich aus dem ursprünglichen Stiftungsziel von 1916 mit dem Ziel, junge Menschen zu Beginn ihrer Karriere zu belehren und anzuspornen. Das Belehren ist dann 1977 dem Anerkennen der Leistung gewichen, denn da hat man festgestellt, belehren lassen sich junge Menschen, die schon so viel erreicht haben, nicht so gerne und nach der Promotion haben sie oft schon wegweisende Forschung getrieben. Und seitdem werden zweijährig auch Auszeichnungen an bis zu zehn junge Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftler vergeben. Diese beiden Preise lassen auch ein einmaliges Netzwerk in Deutschland entstehen, das inzwischen mehr als 100 Personen hat, aus Wissenschaft, Technik, aus ganz verschiedenen Disziplinen, aus Universitäten, Industrie und Gesellschaft und über Generationen hinweg. Und dieses Netzwerk ist auch, was die Stiftung trägt, und was auch bedeutet, dass die Stiftung mit vielen Personen in Interaktion steht und sie auch untereinander vernetzt. Und diese Gruppe gibt auch immer wieder Impulse für Technikwissenschaften, für Netzwerkveranstaltungen, Podiumsdiskussionen oder auch Publikationen zu neuen technologischen Herausforderungen. Und eine Publikation sehen Sie hier, die natürlich auch die Preisträgerinnen und Preisträger diesen Jahres widmet, dass sie sich dann nachher bedienen können. Ja, und damit fördert die Entwicklung die Stiftung Forschungstalente. Forschungstalente brauchen keine Belehrung, aber Motivation auch für die Zukunft. Und das macht dieser Preis aus. Ein Preis, der sie motiviert, weiterzumachen und die Perspektive in diesem Netzwerk auch weiter aktiv zu sein. Ja, und Sie werden jetzt gleich sehen, dass die Preisträgerinnen und Preisträger mit ihrer geleisteten Arbeit genau das auch schon jetzt tun. Nämlich eben neue Motivationen für tolle Themen zu geben, ganz zukunftsweisende Themen. Und ich könnte sagen, dass Sie alle eigentlich auch eine weitere Haltung von Werner von Siemens lebendig halten, nämlich wer neu und anders denkt, kann die Welt verändern. Meine Damen und Herren, ich möchte Ihnen jetzt die Preisträgerinnen und Preisträger nacheinander in alphabetischer Reihenfolge vorstellen und die Auszeichnung verleihen. Diese bestehen, das werden Sie gleich sehen, aus der Medaille, einer Urkunde und Aufnahme in das Netzwerk der Stiftung. Und danach wird jeder oder jeder der ausgezeichneten kurz in das jeweilige preiswürdige Forschungsgebiet einführen. Seien Sie also gespannt. Ja, und damit möchte ich jetzt starten mit dem ersten der Preisträger, das ist Professor Reinhard Heckel. Ich werde ein bisschen was dazu sagen, Sie dürfen aber gerne schon nach seiner Forderung, ich rufe Sie aber gleich auf. Ja, er ist der Rudolf Mössbauer Assistenzprofessor an der Fakultät für Elektrotechnik und Informatik der Technischen Universität München. Wenn Sie seinen Lebenslauf jetzt in Kurzform hören, dann werden Sie sehen, das ist sozusagen ein Who is Who berühmter Einrichtung in der Welt. Er hat zunächst an der Universität Ulm Elektrotechnik studiert und ist dann 2014 an der ETH Zürich in Elektrotechnik promoviert worden und war währenddessen schon Gastdozent am Statistics Department in der Stanford University. Dann hat er sich wieder nach Kalifornien gezogen, wo sie dann am Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science der University of California in Berkeley weitergearbeitet haben und dabei auch noch mal ein Jahr in der Abteilung Cognitive Computing and Computational Sciences bei IBM Research in Zürich. Sie hören schon ein bisschen heraus, was deshalb das Arbeitsgebiet von Herrn Heckel sein könnte, nämlich an der Schnittstelle zwischen maschinellem Lernen, Informationsverarbeitung und Bildrekonstruktion. Und das hat ihn berühmt gemacht, sodass er dann zunächst an der Rice University in Houston, in Texas eine Assistenzprofessur bekommen hat. Und seit 2019 ist er dann an die Technische Universität einem Ruf gefolgt, aber ist immer noch auch Professor an der Rice University. Ja, Sie sind auf dem Gebiet des maschinellen tiefen Lernens sehr aktiv in einer besonderen Entwicklung gelungen, zum Beispiel, wenn man lernen will in verrauschten Umgebung oder wenn es nur wenige Daten gibt. Und das sind ganz besondere, auch wichtige Elemente der technologischen Umsetzung. Aber ganz besonders spektakulär sind ihre interdisziplinären Arbeiten und deshalb ist dieses Institut und das Thema des Instituts jetzt wieder von besonderer Bedeutung, denn sie nutzen auch die DNA als Speichermedium. Ich selbst habe mal optische Datenspeicherung betrieben, aber das ist jetzt eine neue Generation von Speichern, die besonders große Datenmengen auf DNA speichern können für sehr lange Zeiten. Ich denke, das werden wir jetzt gleich hören. Sie dürfen sich also schon mal auf diese Ausführungen ähm, freuen. Ja, Herr Heckel, ich bitte Sie jetzt auf die Bühne 
Wir würden jetzt erst den Preis verleihen und dann würden Sie uns ein bisschen über Ihr Thema berichten. Kommen Sie gerade Ich glaube, ich gehe jetzt mal hier an das Mikrofon erstmal, damit man das auch hört, und dann komme ich zu Ihnen. Herr Heckel erhält also jetzt die Urkunde, ich lese mal den Urkundentext vor. Die Stiftung Werner von Siemensring lädt auf Vorschlag von Dr. Hubertus von Dewitz, Reinhard Heckel, als Jungwissenschaftler zu ihren Veranstaltungen ein und gibt damit die Möglichkeit zum wissenschaftlichen Gedankenaustausch mit den Mitgliedern des Stiftungsrats. Die Auszeichnung erfolgt in Anerkennung seiner herausragenden Arbeiten zu bildgebenden Verfahren, zur Verbesserung der Bildqualität und Algorithmen für die Datenspeicherung in DNS. Ja, herzlichen Glückwunsch. Wenn die Familien vielleicht auch Fotos machen wollen, dürfen es natürlich auch gerne. Sie dürfen dann gerne vorkommen, aber jetzt bekommen Sie auch die Medaille. Ja, vielen Dank. Das können wir erstmal beides in die Erde. Okay, ja. Dann können Sie mir den Vortrag starten. Okay. Dann werde ich den auch. Ja, wird das oben gemacht, oder? Ja, müssen wir Okay, also vielen herzlichen Dank für den Preis, freut freu mich wirklich sehr. Ähm, ich ich mache meinen Vortrag jetzt in Englisch, äh, weil ich den in Englisch vorbereitet habe. Okay, so I'm really excited to share some of my research. So I'm going to talk about learning driven algorithm design. So I, I'm sure you're uh, familiar with like, the impact that machine learning had in all sorts of um, areas. So I'm going to talk about uh, like learning algorithms and what kind of impact that has. Okay, so first of all, uh, algorithms enable modern storage systems. So what you see here is, you see like a floppy disk. So floppy disk has been used, actually has been used till 2019, um, like for all sorts of things. So it's like a storage medium that is entirely physics based in a way, because the way it functions is there's like a magnetic disk and the bits are stored in the magnetization. So now what you see here, you see like a modern hard disk. So it looks just the same, and it relies on the same principle because there are also bits, the information is also stored in kind of magnetized material, but there's one important difference, and the important difference is it's really algorithm enabled. It's algorithm enabled because to, to transition from something like a floppy disk to something like a hard disk that stores like way more information, you have to make things very small, and if you make things very small, you have a lot of errors. So in order to still enable reliable data storage, you need algorithms. So in a way, the hard drive is uh, algorithm enabled. So here's another example of two technologies. So here we see like a physics-based technology. So that's X-ray imaging. So that works like since 100 years by, you take your hand, there comes like an X-ray, um, and it's recorded underneath. And, and that's it, so that's what you see here. So here we have an algorithm-enabled technology. The way that works is you have also an X-ray, but you take a lot of measurements, and those measurements are kind of pieced together using an algorithm. And then you get this really nice, like, 3D image of a hand. So that's not possible um, without uh, using an algorithm. Okay, so algorithms are traditionally designed by experts. So experts can be like physicists, can be engineers, like essentially humans who are like thinking about um, like how do we build this algorithm. Um, what's, what, what has been happening in the past few years is that a new generation of data-driven deep learning based algorithms enable like better performance. And better performance can mean different things. So it can mean a better computational performance in the sense that it's just faster, or it can mean um, better quality, for example. So if we talk about imaging. So what I want to do is I want to talk about like two different topics. So the first topic is storing data on DNA, and that's really driven with an expert-designed algorithm. And then I want to talk about magnetic resonance imaging with a deep neural net network, and that's then like a learning-based algorithm. Okay, so let's get started with uh, DNA storage. <coughs> so why would we want to store information on DNA? 
well, there are two reasons. So one reason is it, you can reach like very high information density. So here you see the information density is for a bunch of uh, traditional storage media. And if we store um, data on DNA, we just achieve way higher information densities. The second reason is the data lasts very long. So for example, if you store your data on a hard drive and you just leave your hard drive like in, you know, in your garage for 10 years or something like that, chances are actually high that the data is going to be lost. You can, of course, write your data in a book. Like this book is 1,000 years old, it's the method of Archimedes. But there is empirical proof, or no, empirical evidence that um, data on DNA lasts very long. So here you have like an ancient horse bone that's 400,000 years old, and people could recover information from this uh, horse bone. OK. So in principle, it's really easy. Like conceptually, it's very easy to store information on DNA because DNA consists of nucleotides. So nucleotides is a sequence of A, C, Gs, and Ts. And so what we can just do in principle is like take the ones and zeros, just map them to A, C, Gs, and just write that. So what makes it difficult is that we have technological constraints in writing DNA. So the technological constraints are as follows. So we cannot write like very long pieces of DNA. So DNA in our body is like very long, it's like three billion base pairs, like human DNA. But we can only write very short pieces. So the pieces are like 100 nucleotides long. So, but we can write as many of them as we want. So for example, in this case, it's four, but we can write like millions of those. And then we can take these pieces and put them somewhere. That's like how we store the data. And for example, in this class here, but then when we read the DNA, we are not going to see all the sequences that we have read. So there's going to be some sequences that we're never going to see. And there's going to be some sequence that we see many times. And any sequence that we see contains errors. So that's kind of like the situation that we, that we have to deal with because of the technological constraints that we have. So if we want to store data reliably, what we have to do is we have to design like an encoder and a corresponding decoder. And the role of the encoder is to take the information and map it to the DNA in such a way that the decoder can then reconstruct the information even when we lose a number of sequences. So the encoder and decoder are both like algorithms. And they are designed together. And they make sure that we can reconstruct the information from the DNA even in such a situation because we don't know which kind of sequences are lost, and we don't know which kind of sequences contain errors. So what we did in 2015 is um, we designed an error correcting scheme for DNA storage. And then there was a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Grass from ETH, and uh, he designed like a physical way how to protect the DNA. And the physical way how to protect the DNA is really essentially um, doing the same thing as if we have the data in like a bone essentially it drives it, it stores it in a dry state. So now we have something to protect the DNA kind of algorithmically, and we have something to protect the DNA um, chemically or physically, and together um, we then build like this um, DNA storage system, so the first robust DNA storage system. And we demonstrated that if we store data that way, like having this algorithmic protection and having this physical protection, then we can store the information for like very long times. All right, so the nice thing about algorithms is you can actually analyze them mathematically. So when you come up with an algorithm, you can reason about them mathematically. So you can ask questions um, of, of the sort, well, can somebody else come up with a better algorithm or not? So you can, for example, prove under certain conditions that an algorithm is, for example, information theoretically optimal. So in our case, we want to add as little information or as little redundancy as possible. And in 2017, we essentially proved that our algorithm is information theoretically optimal, meaning that it really uses the minimum number of redundancy to correct a certain number of, um, of errors. Another interesting thing about algorithms is they sometimes enable like very interesting trade-offs. So the problem with DNA storage is it's extremely expensive. So if you want to store information on DNA, it costs like on the order of like thousand dollars a megabyte. So it's not like, it's not yet practically very viable. Um, but what you can do is you can, you can trade off the, the redundancy and 
some imperfection that are caused by synthesis. So for example, you can use like some synthesis technology that is much cheaper, but has much more errors, but then you can correct those errors uh, using error correcting codes. And that way you can, for example, build like a cheaper system because the algorithm really enables you to trade off these things. So that's something we did in uh, 2021. So um, as I mentioned, uh, DNA storage is still very expensive, but there are already commercial applications. So here's like one commercial application. So what you see here is um, it's a graffiti. It's a graffiti made by uh, a member of the British rock band Massive Attack. So, so anybody know their rock band by any chance? So it's like a rock band and um, the singer is like an artist. And so what he wanted to do is he wanted to celebrate that their album is 20 years old. So he wanted to make a graffiti and not just any graffiti. So this graffiti was made with this uh, spray paint here. And so what the spray paint says is, it says it contains 1 million copies of this album encoded on a million DNA sequences and so on. And there's a reference, so proper scientific work. When they did this uh, spray paint here. Um, and the interesting thing is, if we look at this graffiti, if we scrape off part of the black paint, then we can actually recover the information. So there's so much information in this picture um, and it's kind of stored in DNA. And that's something like it's hardly imaginable how you can do something like this with like a hard drive or with paper or something. So the point I want to make here is like even so a DNA storage is really expensive right now. You can do things with DNA storage that you can't do necessarily with like another storage medium. All right, so, so this, was, this was an example of like an expert design algorithm. And in this example, it really makes sense to have the algorithm designed by an expert because um, we know so much about the statistics of DNA, of the technologies used. So what I want to talk about now is, we'll talk about magnetic resonance imaging with a deep learning based algorithm. So here, the algorithm is not going to be learned, so it's not like expert based. Okay, so. We already saw this, um, uh, thanks for your introduction to, to MRI. So um, in MRI, we have the situation, we have you know, a knee, for example, the data is undersampled, and there's an algorithm, and the goal of the algorithm is to estimate this original image. So the way how this is traditionally done is effectively that the image is a solution to an optimization problem. So this optimization problem can be you know, like something linear, something nonlinear, but conceptually, it's essentially an expert thinking about how can we formulate this as an um, optimization problem. And for example, today in the lab, we, we saw some reconstructions. Those were reconstructed using um, like a, a really complicated version of such uh, optimization problem. And that's used in clinical practice today. So now, like a learning-based approach to this problem is the following. We take a neural network. Um, so that's an example of a neural network, and we design the neural network in a particular way, and then we train it to map the measurement to the clean image. And training means we have a lot of training data, so for example, a lot of knees and a lot of corresponding measurements, and then we train the network to map those measurements to the clean image. And if we do that on sufficiently much data, then this, this actually works really well. So we get an algorithm that is both fast computationally fast and gives us really good image quality. All right, so what we did in this work or in this area is that like we were thinking about, so how much data do we really need for such a problem? And is it possible to train the neural network just on one measurement? So for example, today in the lab, we saw like a person in the scanner, we're taking a measurement and this approach is training a neural network just on this one measurement. So it's not trained on data, it's just trained on one measurement. And it turns out if we train a neural network just on this one measurement, it's called self-supervised learning, then we can also achieve actually really high image quality. So we do not necessarily, it's not necessary to have a lot of data in all sorts of situations. So we, even from one measurement, we can learn a lot. So how well does this perform? So here's an expert design algorithm. That gives us actually pretty good image quality. In this particular example, where we have a four times acceleration, we do see some artifacts. If we have the self-supervised learning approach, where we train a neural network just on this one data point, we already get better performance. And then if we take a neural network that's trained on a lot of data, 
that gives us like really good performance essentially. So you see it a little bit, there are no artifacts here. Okay, so now um, that is a technology that is already starting to be used like in, um, in clean few scanners today. For example, a few weeks back, I was at a conference um, for magnetic resonance imaging and all the big vendors were there and they all make advertisement um, by you know, essentially saying we have a deep learning based reconstruction algorithm and for Siemens that is called a deep result. So there is a concern. So essentially there is this robustness concern. So the algorithm that we have now it's, it's going to be learned from data. So we don't really understand everything about the algorithm. It's very different than expert design algorithm where we have like a really good understanding what the algorithm is doing. So there's this general concern that the algorithm might not be robust. For example, it could um, omit like important parts. So what you see here is there's a knee and it has a pathology. Here you have the reconstruction, the pathology is gone. So people are worried about this kind of behavior. Um, like in my research, we are looking a lot at these robustness concerns. Um, so we do empirical studies and we try to design algorithms that are robust. I don't really have time to talk about this, but uh, what we have found and what also a lot of other people have kind of found is that deep learning based algorithms are no less robust than classical algorithms. So that's not saying they are not robust, right? Because um, in a certain situation, they are not robust, but they are no less robust than classical kind of expert design uh, algorithms. All right, so, so let's uh, take a step back a little bit. So what has happened is that compute resources, they really enabled an era of information processing systems that are based on expert design algorithms. And that's really like a development that happened with the availability of compute. So just to illustrate that, um, 1940, we didn't really have computers. But there was actually a mechanical design to perform computer tomography. Uh, computer tomography. So it was purely uh, mechanical because there were no computers. In 1946, we, we had computers already. So this is a John from Neumann who you know developed um, the or who is a pioneer in computers. Um, and at the time, he actually wrote a research grant and he said, "Well, we want to do tomography, but we don't have tomography. So let's do something else." Got rejected at the time, but the important point here is, at this time, we just couldn't do tomography because we didn't have compute. So uh, a few years later, 70 plus, um, we we can perform computer tomography just, be just because we have the com uh, compute available for that, right? So what that shows is that it was really the availability of computing resources that enabled this development. And so then the question is, why? Well, what is enabling the you know what is enabling this new technology of algorithms. So now we have a new situation. So first of all, we have much more compute resources. So we have like GPUs that are extremely powerful and we have a lot of data. So now we have these two resources in our disposal and these two resources to some extent can actually be traded off with each other, right? We saw that a self-supervised algorithm is very slow, but doesn't require a lot of data. Can have a fast algorithm that requires a lot of data. And this availability of compute resources and data is enabling a new generation of information processing systems that are based on learning um, or on learned algorithms, essentially. All right, so I think uh, that the learning based algorithm design really is at, its, at its beginning. So, what you see here is actually an MRI scan, also like of a heart that we saw today. It's actually my heart in this case. Um, it, it should be moving. Um, the point I want to make here is this is an image that is, or it's a, you know, a little video, it's only three megabytes large, so it's very small, but it's based on 200 megabytes of measurement data. So intuition kind of tells us, well, if we just had an algorithm that pieces all these measurements together in a much smarter way, then we should get much higher image quality than that. And like, I think like that learning-based algorithms can um, contribute in, to some extent, to you know, increasing resolution and give us better systems in such an example. All right, so just to wrap up, um, so now there are expert designed algorithms and they make a lot of sense in situations where the physics can be modeled accurately. So for example, for DNA storage, it doesn't make sense to have a learning based algorithm because everything can be modeled very well. And then there can be an expert, can think about the algorithm and that's gonna give you the best performance. But then there are situations like imaging 
where it's very hard to model things accurately. So for example, you look at an image, you know it's a natural image, but it's very hard for you to describe that mathematically. So in such situations, uh, data-driven deep learning-based algorithms are a very useful tool. All right, so thank you for your attention. Yeah, and thank you very much, Professor Heckel, for this clear and very inspiring talk. Maybe you have some questions about it, but we decided to leave our questions to the discussion outside, where we have and also some yeah, drinks and some reception together. So uh, thank you very much. Again, congratulations, and yeah, all the best. Thank you. Ja, jetzt würde ich wieder zu Deutsch wechseln und würde nun Frau Olga Kassian vorstellen. Sie hat Chemie studiert an der Nepropetrovsk National University und hat dort 2013 in derselben Stadt in der Ukrainian State University of Chemical Technology promoviert. Und schon in der Promotion beschäftigt sie sich mit Fragen der Elektrokatalyse und deren Anwendung für elektrochemische Energieumwandlung. Es hört sich im ersten Moment speziell an, aber es geht darum, wie man die Wasserstoffproduktion besser und effektiver machen kann. Das ist ja, wie Sie spätestens in diesem Jahr wissen, von hoher Bedeutung. Danach wechselte sie das Land und ging als Postdoktorandin zunächst an die Brandenburgische Technische Universität in Cottbus und erhielt dann 2015 ein hochrangiges Forschungsstipendium der Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung, das ist sozusagen auch eine der großen Auszeichnungen für internationale Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftler in der Humboldt-Stiftung aufgenommen zu werden. Und das hat sie zunächst am Max-Bank-Institut für Eisenforschung in Düsseldorf verbracht. Auch da hat sie weiterentwickelt Verfahren der Elektrokatalyse zur Wasserstofferzeugung und Wasserstoffspeicherung. Und dann hat sie ein weiteres Stipendium erhalten 2019 der Helmholtz-Gemeinschaft und hat dann eine Helmholtz-Nachwuchsgruppe am helmholtz Zentrum Berlin geleitet. Und das ist, ähm, ja... Eine wichtige Station gewesen, sie hat dort dynamische Veränderungen in Materialien während elektrokatalytischer Reaktionen betrachtet. Mich freut das besonders, weil die PTB auch zwei Zweigstellen in Berlin hat, eines in Charlottenburg und eines eben am Helmholtz-Zentrum in Berlin, an dem Beschleuniger Bessie 2, bei dem auch die PTB an solchen Fragen arbeitet. Also freut mich das, dass Sie auch da Stationen hatten. Ja, und seit 2021 ist sie nun Juniorprofessorin für Materialien zur elektrochemischen Energieumwandlung an der Friedrich-Alexander-Universität in Erlangen-Nürnberg. Und jetzt beschäftigt sie sich ganz intensiv mit Fragen der Herstellung grünen Wasserstoffs und wie man die im Moment noch mangelnde Energieeffizienz bei diesem Herstellung von Wasserstoff in den dafür notwendigen Katalysatoren erhöhen kann. Und das ist ein so wichtiges Forschungsgebiet heute, dass sie direkt noch bei all dem über die Energie von morgen forschen, was wichtig ist. Frau Kasian, ich freue mich auch besonders, dass wir mit Ihnen eine ukrainische Wissenschaftlerin auszeichnen dürfen. Wenn wir an die letzten Monate denken, die furchtbaren letzten Monate nach der russischen Invasion, dann hat das gezeigt, wie wichtig es ist, dass die internationale Staatengemeinschaft die Demokratie nachdrücklich verteidigt. Aber dass sie auch die Wissenschaft zum Beispiel in der Ukraine verteidigt, denn gerade die Wissenschaft in solchen Zeiten kann Personen vernetzen und kann auch ein Zeichen gegen die Aggression setzen. Und deshalb, Frau Kasian, bitte ich Sie jetzt auf die Bühne, um Ihnen auch die Auszeichnung der Werner von Siemens ähm, bringen Sie von der Medaille und der Urkunde zu überreichen. Auch hier lese ich jetzt ein Mikrofon für die im Stream nochmal vor, woher die Auszeichnung kommt. Die Stiftung Werner von Siemens Ring lädt auf Vorschlag der Hermanns von Helmholtz Gemeinschaft Deutscher Forschungsrenten Olga Kassian als Jungwissenschaftlerin zu ihren Veranstaltungen ein und gibt damit die Möglichkeit zum wissenschaftlichen Gedankenaustausch mit den Mitgliedern des Stiftungsrats. Die Auszeichnung erfolgt in Anerkennung ihrer herausragenden Arbeiten zur Elektrolyse für die Wasserstoffherstellung aus erneuerbaren Energien. Thank you. 
Ja, Frau Dr. Sehr, freuen wir uns auch auf Ihren Vortrag und sind gespannt, was Sie uns berichten können. Danke. Ja, vielleicht, ah, nee, und dann nochmal das Bild vielleicht auch mal hell machen. Ah ja, genau, und jetzt müssen Sie Ihren Vortrag wahrscheinlich auch machen. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today. And uh, I would like to share with you my research highlight. So I'm doing research in the field of electrocatalysis for energy conversion and storage. And I will show you how important electrochemistry is for our uh, sustainable future. So the energy of the sunlight that is coming to the Earth is about 3,000 times the amount of energy that we uh, need for our daily activities. And this makes sun the most ab abundant uh, renewable energy source. However, we cannot use uh, sun energy fully because of intermittency of such power. And this is because the sun shines only 12 hours per day and the rest of the time we got darkness. So it means that we need to develop some uh, solutions for energy storage. And these solutions have to be also environmentally friendly. So what we can do, we can use the sun energy or wind energy and uh, break water into hydrogen and oxygen and use them further as uh, fuels. And this water electrolysis technology is actually the key technology in our renewable energy cycle because clean hydrogen can uh, help us to realize transition of our energy systems in multiple sectors from energy generation, storage, distribution, also to the end uses in uh, mobility, heating or industry. However, this technology is uh, quite expensive, which makes it uh, not so attractive for industry. And because of that, at the moment, only about 1% of all hydrogen production capacity uh, comes uh, to uh, green hydrogen. And the high cost originates from a low efficiency and instability of materials that we use to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And these materials, they called catalysts. So what they do, they um, break water molecules into hydrogen and into oxygen when we uh, apply electrical energy. So we have hydrogen production at the cathode side and oxygen generation at the anode side. And they separated by uh, electrolyte, which is basic uh, or acidic. And uh, these catalyst materials, they uh, have to provide the highest possible rates of hydrogen and oxygen generation. Uh, by uh, consuming lowest possible amount of energy. This is a very challenging task. And uh, in uh, state-of-the-art uh, alkaline electrolyzers, which is the mature technology for hydrogen production up to megawatt range, we have nickel-based materials. Uh, and this is relatively cheap catalyst because nickel has uh, high abundance. However, this technology has other limitations related to low uh, partial load, uh, limited current density, which means limited uh, rates formation of hydrogen and oxygen, and uh, low operation pressure. So in practice, we need to build a quite big electrolyzer to generate certain amount of hydrogen. And in contrast, in acidic water electrolysis, we use a proton exchange membrane instead of a liquid electrolyte. And this membrane has uh, extremely high conductivity and low gas crossover. 
So it allows us uh, to uh, build uh, so-called membrane electrode assemblies. Uh, they're very compact and we can have a small electrolyzer with uh, extremely high efficiency. But there is another drawback because we have uh, extremely corrosive acidic environment. And this demands using um, noble and expensive metals as the catalyst. So in uh, state of the art, uh, water electrolyzers uh, based on uh, proton exchange membrane electrode assembly, we have uh, platinum to catalyze uh, hydrogen production and iridium to catalyze uh, oxygen formation. And these are nearly the only materials that can withstand uh, such harsh ICD conditions on the long term. However, even iridium and platinum slowly undergo degradation under dynamic operation of the electrolyzer. And this is especially crucial for oxygen formation because oxygen uh, leads to oxidation of the material. And as a result, we lose expensive catalyst and we lose efficiency. So our ultimate goal is to design the catalyst material that uh, would be efficient and also stable. And to hinder the degradation processes, we need to understand them at the atomic scale. And this is very challenging because we need uh, methods with uh, uh, high sensitivity and excellent resolution. And uh, imagine that only topmost atoms of the catalyst contribute to the catalysis. And in time, these surface atoms, they might be oxidized, they might be poisoned, or they can even dissolve and leave catalytic surface. And as a result, we have deterioration of uh, performance. So to uh, tackle this challenge, we uh, developed a unique approach which uh, combines electrochemistry and atom crop tomography, which is a mass spectrometry based technique that allows us to detect distribution of individual atoms within the catalytic surface in three dimensions. And using this method, we uh, discovered that during uh, uh, water splitting and formation of oxygen, metallic iridium catalyst transforms in time into a stable phase of oxide, but this phase is uh, not really uh, reactive. But this transition happens via formation of a metastable non-stoichiometric uh, phase and this phase has extremely high reactivity, but it also degrades faster. And this led me to the idea that both reactions, uh, formation of oxygen and catalyst degradation, might be linked via formation of uh, common intermediates. And ideally, we need to know all these intermediates in order to uh, hinder unwanted processes such as degradation and shift equilibrium towards the uh, desired reaction, which is oxygen or hydrogen formation. So we used a method of isotope labeling in uh, combination with synchrotron-based methods and we uh, detected all of these uh, intermediates. And now we can um, provide the feedback to the engineer. So for example, to hinder degradation in this case, we need to control pH uh, at the electrolyzer. Another uh, important mechanism that can lead to degradation in a more reactive catalyst includes the um, lattice of the catalyst itself. Uh, for instance, um, some of the catalysts, they uh, can degrade uh, via release of oxygen molecule directly from the oxide lattice. And even the most uh, stable uh, iridium dioxide based catalysts, they are not inert and they slowly undergo uh, structural changes at the surface. 
So we used method of isotope labeling and we discovered that there is a constant exchange between oxygen in the catalyst and oxygen in water in the first two nanometers of the uh, catalytic surface. And it seems not to be crucial, two nanometers is a very thin layer. However, this can become an issue in the real electrolyzer if uh, the reaction is catalyzed by the nanoparticles, uh, which are below two nanometers in size. So we developed an approach and uh, or several approaches that can uh, improve stability of catalyst material uh, without uh, sacrificing efficiency. For example, uh, we can um, also increase uh, efficiency of catalyst utilization if we disperse it onto uh, some sort of support which is made of a more abundant element. An example of uh, such uh, approach are um, catalysts uh, that are supported on uh, tin oxide. And in case of iridium-based catalyst, this approach is especially beneficial because there is an interaction between uh, catalyst and support material. And this interaction leads to uh, enhanced uh, stability. Another way how we can uh, improve uh, efficiency of the catalyst, we can simply increase the number of active sites available for the reaction by increasing uh, surface area. And this can be nicely seen in these uh, porous uh, structures of hydrous oxides. And these uh, structures, they act as a three-dimensional catalyst because all these nanopores are available for the reaction. Moreover, uh, these pores are filled with hydroxo species and these species are extremely uh, reactive. But this approach has a disadvantage compared to compact uh, structured catalysts. Because if we increase the surface area, we increase the number of active sites that are not only available for the desired reactions, but they're also available for unwanted processes such as uh, degradation. So here we need to find the balance between uh, activity and stability of uh, material. And uh, finally, the way how we can uh, stabilize active sites within the catalytic surface, and this is uh, what we really look for in electrocatalysis, are so-called synergy effects, when um, the properties uh, can be improved by forming alloys or mixed oxides, so that the functional properties of the obtained mixtures are superior uh, to uh, that of uh, individual uh, components. And um, using this approach, we stabilized uh, platinum-based catalysts uh, for hydrogen production. So we alloyed the platinum with a few atomic percent of more stable elements uh, like gold or titanium. And we created the structures where um, the most vulnerable sites of platinum catalysts, such as the lattice imperfections, uh, dislocations, uh, grain boundaries, um, they sealed by a more stable gold or more stable uh, titanium. And such catalysts uh, show stable performance on uh, a long term of uh, electrolysis. Similar approach can be used to stabilize uh, iridium-based materials for oxygen production. Uh, by alloying them with uh, something less reactive but uh, more stable. Uh, for example, mixtures of iridium with uh, titanium oxides, um, they show enhanced uh, stability, so we do not observe uh, dissolution of iridium uh, and dissolution of titanium, even if we reduce uh, loading of iridium up to uh, 50%. Uh, which is uh, quite uh, significant. 
At the same time, these materials have extremely high activity, so they are as good as iridium itself, but we have lower loading of the noble metal. And the reason of such uh, excellent performance originates from special atomic scale structure of these materials, and they consist of metallic iridium matrix, uh, which provides high catalytic activity. And this matrix uh, is mixed with titanium oxide enriched clusters that provide high stability. So in summary, um, I would like to say that uh, we can design active and stable catalysts uh, based on uh, understanding of the uh, processes at the atomic scale. Of course, uh, these are not the only challenges that we face here because uh, we need also to put efforts in uh, developing the infrastructure for hydrogen. Uh, we uh, need to um, develop approaches for hydrogen distribution and transportation. And uh, these questions cannot be answered by a single field of science. So um, scientists from different fields and engineers have to work together for our sustainable future. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I'm, um, please ask questions if you have any. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Professor Kasian, for this um, yeah very instructive and very important research you did, and yeah, all the best also to you. Yeah, then I come now to the third prize winner, Herr Dr. Stephen King. Ah, ah, okay. <lacht> Danke. Kommen wir also zum dritten Preisträger, Herr Stephen King. Bei ihm bin ich ein wenig befangen, da er in der Physikalisch-Technischen Bundesanstalt arbeitete oder auch noch arbeitet. Aber da er von meinem Vorgänger, Professor Johann Ulrich, noch vorgeschlagen wurde, freue ich mich einfach mit Ihnen. Er ging über diese verdiente Auszeichnung. Ich will ihn auch kurz vorstellen und dann wird er auch seine Arbeit präsentieren. Herr King erhielt seinen Master of Science 2008 von der britischen Universität Durham. Er entdeckte damals bereits sein Interesse an der Metrologie und wechselte dann zu einer unserer Schwesterorganisationen, nämlich dem National Physics Laboratory in Teddington bei London. Das ist also die Nationale Metrologie Institut von Großbritannien. Er arbeitet dort an der nächsten Generation von hochpräzisen Uhren. Sie basieren nicht mehr auf Quarz, vielleicht wie die Uhren, die sie noch als Armbanduhren tragen, sondern aus gefangenen Ionen. Und da diese mit Licht gefangen werden, redet man auch von sogenannten optischen Atomuhren. Und diese Uhren, die gehen so genau, würden die seit dem Urknall funktioniert haben, dann würden sie bis heute nur ungefähr eine Sekunde nachgehen. Und wenn man sich das überlegt, das ist eine unvorstellbar hohe Genauigkeit. Wir reden davon, dass die Abweichung nur 10 hoch minus 18 ist. Und diese unvorstellbar hohe, hohe Genauigkeit, die hat eben Herr King an der Universität Oxford untersucht und hat dafür 2013 einen deutschen Titel bekommen. 2016 ist er dann eben nach Braunschweig an die PTB gekommen, an das sogenannte Quest-Institut, bei dem wir auch mit der Universität Hannover zusammenarbeiten. Und dort hat er in der Arbeitsgruppe von Professor Piet Schmidt die Entwicklung der ersten optischen Atomohr mit hochgeladenen kalten Ionen realisiert. Und er wird uns gleich erklären, was da die Besonderheit ist. Eine Besonderheit davon ist, dass man damit nicht nur Uhren realisieren kann, sondern dass auch die Basis ist für die nächste Generation von Quantencomputern. Und das verfolgt jetzt Herr King als Senior Quantum Scientist bei der Firma Oxford Ionics mit dem Ziel, einen praktischen und skalierbaren Quantencomputer auf Ionenbasis zu entwickeln. Herr King Ihre Arbeit ist, glaube ich, ein hervorragendes Beispiel davon, wie man jetzt von der Grundlagenforschung doch dann relativ schnell auch zu technologischen Anwendungen kommt. Und wir sind gespannt auf Ihre Ausführungen und was es mit den Quantencomputern in Zukunft aus sich hat. Ich bitte Sie jetzt auch nach vorne, damit ich Ihnen die Urkunde vergeben kann. Ja, auch bei Ihnen lese ich wieder die Urkunde vor, ein bisschen näher am Mikrofon, damit wir im Stream das hören. Die Stiftung Werner von Siemensring lädt auf Vorschlag der Physikalisch-Technischen Bundesanstalt Stephen King als Jungwissenschaftler zu ihren Veranstaltungen ein und gibt damit die Möglichkeit zum wissenschaftlichen Gedankenaustausch 
mit den Mitgliedern des Stiftungsrates. Die Auszeichnung erfolgt in Anerkennung seiner herausragenden Arbeiten zur kohärenten Spektroskopie von hochgeladenen Ionen und deren Entwicklung zur optischen Uhr. Vielen herzlichen Freuen wir uns jetzt auch Ihren Vortrag und schicken genau auf die Zeit. Okay, thank you very much. It really is a great honor to be able to present the work that we've been doing at the PTB for the last uh, seven or eight years, where we've been developing the world's first optical atomic clock based on highly charged atomic ions. I'll start just by giving a very brief interview, uh, introduction into what uh, optical atomic clocks actually are, before talking about the advantages of highly charged ions for this particular application. I'll introduce our experimental setup, talk about how we overcome some of the limitations of highly charged ions, then the very first error budget that came out of the clock uh, just this year, followed up by a measurement of the optical transition frequency, along with some uh, atomic parameters that we need, I'm finally close by giving a very brief summary and outlook as to what will be going on in the lab over the next few months. So at the heart of any uh, optical atomic clock is an ultra-stable laser, uh, which has an oscillation frequency of about 500 trillion cycles per second. And it's this really high oscillation frequency that allows us to make such precision measurements. We deliver a sample of this laser to a reference atom or ion that we've trapped somehow. And this atom or ion uh, generally has uh, a so-called three-level atomic structure where if we have, we have a, a, a stable ground state, some short-lived excited state here, from which the ion can decay back to the ground state in a few nanoseconds. And it's this kind of transition that we can use for uh, laser cooling the ions down to a temperature of about a mini Kelvin. We then have this metastable excited state here, which has a natural lifetime on the order of seconds, days, or even years, uh, before it decays naturally to the ground state. And what this means is that if we address this transition with our ultra-stable laser, uh, we must tune the frequency of the laser extremely precisely in order to be able to even excite the ion, which is what creates such uh, excellent frequency references. So we can tune our laser around and see how the atom responds, and then close the feedback loop that stabilizes the frequency of the laser, which is free to drift with things like room temperature or air pressure, um, so that the stability of the atomic transition is transferred over to the laser. The last piece of the puzzle is a so-called femtosecond frequency comb, which I don't have too much time to go into now, but this uh, performs the role of down conversion of the optical frequency signal down into the microwave domain, where we can then use conventional electronics to count it. We can also use this device to compare different clocks of different species against one another to evaluate their performance. So since their inception in the 1960s, uh, atomic clocks have improved uh, extremely rapidly. So what we see here are two different data sets. In blue here, we have the microwave frequency standards that we currently use to define the second in the SI system of units. And the best systems today typically have an uncertainty of about one part in 10 to the 16. But then we also have these red data points, which are the optical frequency standards, so those based on lasers rather than microwaves. And we see that they improved even more rapidly since their uh, development in the, in the late 1990s, up to the point where in about 2010, the two lines cross, and the optical standards began to regularly outperform their microwave counterparts. And so now it's become a question of really when and not if we redefine the second in terms of an optical transition. In fact, we actually also have our first data point now off the bottom of this graph, where the group at NIST in the USA, so that's also at the National Metrology Institute of the USA, were able to uh, realize a systematic uncertainty of nine parts in 10 to the 19 for their aluminum iron clock. So again, this is the kind of system that then, uh, if it had been uh, started at the moment of the Big Bang 14 billion years ago, would have only lost about a second by now. So with this kind of exceptional performance, we can think of all kinds of potential applications from a day-to-day -day application that we pretty much all have, which is satellite navigation. So with ever more precise frequency metrology, can we get ever more precise uh, position resolution? Um, the precision of optical clocks opens up a whole new application uh, referred to as relativistic geodesy, where we can actually build two identical clocks, separate them by some height difference, and we'll actually see that the clocks tick at different rates caused by um, the difference in their gravitational potential. So this is a consequence of general relativity. 
So we can actually use this to measure height differences at the centimeter level. Coming back to physics, we then have um, precision tests of things like nuclear physics, quantum electrodynamics, and also searching for physics beyond our standard model, where we can search for things like a hypothetical fifth force that could couple electrons to neutrons, a violation of Lorentz invariance, which says that your experiment should be independent of the inertial reference frame in which you're performing it, and even any potential time variation of what we think of as the fundamental constants, which could have implications for things like detection of dark matter. So where do highly charged ions fit into this? Well, highly charged ions expand the range of uh, atoms or ions that we can then use for our atomic clocks. We like to think of highly charged ions as essentially being the third dimension of the periodic table. So every element has as many positive charge states as it does electrons in its neutral state. So we really have uh, many to choose from, and this has led to dozens of uh, theoretical publications over the last 10 years or so, proposing some of these species for use in both uh, precise clocks and for tests of fundamental physics. So optical spectroscopy on highly charged ions is nothing new. Uh, people have been doing this since uh, about the 1940s, um, but for most of the last 30 years, this has been dominated by devices known as electron beam ion traps. And what they do is they can find a hot plasma of highly charged ions at a temperature of about a megakelvin, and then you can uh, analyze the light that comes out of this plasma using a grating spectrometer or something similar. And what you see are uh, lines that are Doppler broadened to the, lines of ten, to the level of tens of gigahertz. Um, and this is caused mostly by the megakelvin uh, temperatures at which the ions find themselves. And this means that even in the best cases, people were able to achieve a uncertainty on their measurements of about 150 megahertz. So this is to be compared against the millihertz level uncertainties that you get from optical atomic clocks. Uh, this was actually improved upon uh, a few years ago by the group of Sven Sturm at the Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics down in Heidelberg. They were able to get an uncertainty of about nine parts per billion uh, by confining ions in a penning trap and then cooling them down to the Kelvin level. But still, we've got an uncertainty gap of about 10 orders of magnitude down to the optical clocks. So the question is, how do we bridge that gap? And the answer is that we have to cool the ions down even further and then control the systematic conditions under which the ions find themselves far more uh, precisely. So this is the experiment we built in order to do that. The experiment is actually split into two rooms. We have a, a wall, dividing wall down the middle. And on the left side of the uh, wall, we have here all of the noisy equipment that we don't really want in our quiet laser lab on the right hand side here. Most of the top part of the diagram is our uh, cryostat, which is what we use to cool our uh, iron trap down to a temperature of about four Kelvin. Um, this is of a, a home build design, which was designed to have very low um, vibration transmission from the cold head to the iron trap region up here. We produce our highly charged ions in our electron beam iron trap down at the bottom left hand corner here. Uh, and then we transfer them up to the pole trap at the top right hand corner uh, via this uh, deceleration beam line here. So the pole trap looks like something like this. And then in the pole trap, we create a so-called two iron coulomb crystal, where we can find one single highly charged ion with a single ion of singly ionized beryllium. And the beryllium is there because the highly charged ion uh, can't directly be laser cooled itself. Uh, so the beryllium ion couples to the highly charged ion through the coulomb interaction, and we can extract energy from the pair as a whole just by laser cooling the beryllium. The reason that we have to operate the experiment at cryogenic temperatures is because highly charged ions are extremely susceptible to charge exchange collisions. At a good room temperature ultra high vacuum of maybe 10 to the minus 11 millibar, uh, our ion would last for a matter of seconds before it underwent one of these uh, reactions. But by cooling down to 4 Kelvin, we can take advantage of cryopumping and we can actually store our ion for a typical period of about an hour and a half, uh, which is, because uh, it only takes us about five minutes to reload one after we lose it, this is a relatively good uh, uptime. It's com uh, competitive with actually some other optical clocks as well. So uh, another thing that highly charged ions in general are lacking are the ability to do direct internal state detection. So if we've driven our clock transition, we need to be able to figure out somehow if we've actually driven it successfully. And so to do this, we use a technique called quantum logic spectroscopy. And this works by uh, taking advantage of the fact that the motion of the two ions in the pole trap is coupled. And secondly, that it's quantized. So we can manipulate it at a single quantum level. We start off by picking one of the motional modes of the ion crystal. So we have six in total. We have uh, sort of the Z direction, uh, X direction, and Y direction in and out of the uh, plane. And then the ions can move both in and out of phase with each other in each of these directions. So we pick one of these modes and cool it down to the quantum mechanical ground state, and then prepare both of their ions in their uh, electronic ground states, like we see here. We then attempt to excite our clock transition using a pulse from our ultra-stable laser, which will then drive the highly charged ion to its electronic excited state without chasing its emotional state. 
And it will do this with some probability, or it will create some superposition of the two states. We then apply a second pulse, which attempts to drive the highly charged ion back to the ground state, but this time we've detuned the frequency of the laser by the eigenfrequency of the motional mode we're using for the state transfer. And what this does is it creates a kind of uh, controlled knot operation where the state of the highly charged ion, uh, or sorry, the state of the motional uh, state of the crystal will change only if the highly charged ion was excited during the first pulse. So we've coherently transferred the information about the internal state of the highly charged ion into the shared motional state of the ion crystal. So if we were successful, the, motional, uh, the ion crystal begins to move. Because the motion is shared, we can then use the beryllium ion to uh, detect this motion by another sequence of laser pulses. And then we read out the internal state of the beryllium ion using uh, normal state-dependent fluorescence techniques, shining in another laser here. And hence, we've actually determined the internal state of the highly charged ion uh, by reading out the state of the beryllium ion. So using these techniques, we're able to demonstrate the first ever quantum logic spectroscopy of a highly charged ion. We can see here that we can tune our laser over the atomic resonance and see a line width of about 50 hertz which is about nine orders of magnitude narrower than what you saw in the earlier slide with the in EBIT spectroscopy. And we can also coherently manipulate the two states. So we can drive what's our so-called Rabi oscillations between the ground and the excited states using our ultra-stable laser. And this exponential uh, uh, suppression of the fringe contrast is decoherence caused by the finite excited state lifetime in the highly charged ion, which is about 10 milliseconds. However, I've only told you about half the story about the, uh, the sympathetic cooling of the highly charged ion using the beryllium ion. This cooling works really well in the, direct, uh, the direction where the two ions move um, uh, parallel to one another, uh, sorry, perpendicular to one another, but when they move parallel to one another, we actually see a huge suppression in the cooling efficiency, about five orders of magnitude, in fact. And so uh, any residual motion in any of these two modes would lead to a systematic shift of our clock transition caused by the time dilation caused by this tiny residual motion. Therefore, we had to develop a technique that would allow us to cool this motion uh, to the ground state and we did this, and we uh, refer to this as algorithmic cooling, which actually resembles the quantum logic sequence um, uh, in many ways, and essentially it corresponds to a removal of uh, motional photons one by one uh, from this uh, ion crystal. And we see this by seeing how the motional sidebands of our clock transition change. So what we see is that when we've uh, got, uh, after initial cooling, uh, we've got a very slight asymmetry between our red and our blue sidebands here, uh, which comes from the fact that the ion is very close to the Doppler limit here of about half a millikelvin, but after the cooling, these red sidebands disappear, meaning we can't remove any more phonons from the crystal. So the modes are in the ground state, which means that this is actually the coldest highly charged ion that's ever been produced in a lab with a temperature of less than 200 microkelvins. And actually, arguably, this is the coldest highly charged ion that's ever existed. So after this cooling, we were able to compile our first ever systematic error budget. And what we see is that in the top line here, we have a, a shift, a technical shift caused by uh, called excess micromotion which limits our clock uncertainty to about two parts in 10 to the 17. Um, this is a completely technical noise source that can be uh, uh, eliminated by replacement of our iron track with one of a more uh, precisely assembled uh, design. But nevertheless, it's not bad for a first try. So how do our measurements compare to what's come before? So for, in terms of measurements of the transition frequency, we can see that here that this is the uh, measurement I showed you earlier, about nine parts per billion uncertainty performed by ion, uh, using ions cooled to the Kelvin level. Um, and actually, in a, a separate um, group at the Max Planck Institute, they were also able to measure the isotope shifts of this transition uh, between the isotopes of 40 argon and 36 argon um, with an uncertainty of about half a percent. But with our system, we're able to measure the transition frequency with about an uncertainty of about one and a half parts in 10 to the 16, so an improvement of about eight orders of magnitude, and the isotope shift with an uncertainty of about 100 millihertz, so that's an improvement of about nine orders of magnitude over the previous state of the art. So uh, showing again this graph that we saw earlier, and so um, this was the uh, penning trap measurement here at nine parts per billion, and we're operating now all the way down here at levels of a few parts in 10 to the 17, uh, total systematic uncertainty, really knocking on the door of the best optical atomic clocks. Uh, one interesting thing about the isotope shift measurement is it also allows us to contribute to uh, tests of uh, fundamental physics. So in our case, we were able to uh, resolve the contribution to the isotope shift from the QED nuclear recoil effects for the very first time. Um, and so, yes, this is again another example of how we can use these ultra-precise clocks um, for real high precision tests of fundamental physics at low energies. So to summarize, uh, we've brought uh, online the first ever optical atomic clock based on highly charged ions. 
And this first generation system has systematic uncertainty of two parts in 10 to the 17. Um, using a, a comparison against an interbium ion optical frequency standard at the PTB, we had then measured the transition frequency with an uncertainty of about one and a half parts in 10 to the 16, uh, and thereby improved the uncertainty on the transition frequency by eight orders of magnitude, and the isotope shift by nine orders of magnitude. So uh, the experiment is currently undergoing um, surgery to um, allow us to load highly charged calcium into the pole trap rather than highly charged argon, which we were using up until now. And I actually believe that they've actually this week loaded their first highly charged uh, calcium ions, five in here. Um, and the calcium is particularly interesting because uh, it has many different stable isotopes with zero nuclear spin, which means we can use it to search for this potential fifth force that couples electrons to neutrons. The, the systematic uncertainty of the system will be reduced even further by uh, replacement of the ion trap. And then um, effort will go on to the development of a uh, a very promising optical clock candidate, which is nickel 12 plus, which actually has a very long lived metastable excited state with a lateral lifetime of about 20 seconds, which means that we should be able to improve the stability of our measurements, which here were about three parts in 10 to the 14 with a measurement time of a second, down to more like parts in 10 to the 16, at one part, uh, one second of averaging time. So I'd just like to close by thanking the really great team who've worked on that project over the years. So the first generation of PhD students, uh, Tobias and Peter, and then the second generation, uh, Lucas and Alex, who've carried on their great work. And in particular, a lot of this wouldn't have been possible without our fantastic collaboration with our friends at the Max Planck Institute for, the nuclear, uh, for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg in the group of Jose Crespo, and our uh, colleagues at the PTB, including the Terbium Iron Clock, led by Niels Hunterman. Uh, the frequency comb work was led by Eric Benkler, and also the input from our theory colleagues in the groups of Andrei Serchikov and Vladimir Yerikin. Um, thank you very much, and I look forward to any questions you might have uh, later. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, now you know how precise time can be and you know what can become out of it. And we're all looking forward to having optical clocks once to define the second. Thank you very much. Nun würde ich, also genau, ich schalte hier wieder aus. Macht das Bildpunkt? Ja. Ja, der letzte hochkarätige Preisträger mit einem auch sehr spannenden aktuellen Thema ist Herr Dr. Daniel Neidner, den ich Ihnen jetzt vorstellen möchte. Und er kommt vom Institut für Robotik und Mechatronik am Deutschen Zentrum für Luft- und Raumfahrt. Ja, mit dieser Adresse habe ich jetzt schon ein bisschen das Forschungsthema von Herrn Leitner verraten. Es geht um Robotik, Roboter für die Gesellschaft von morgen. Herr Leitner promovierte 2017 am Institut für Robotik und Mechatronik der Universität Bremen. Und er hat sich damals schon mit der Frage beschäftigt, welche besonderen kognitiven humanoiden Fähigkeiten brauchen denn Service-Roboter? Was sind Service-Roboter? Ein Roboter, der Staub saugt, der das Laub aufsammelt, ein Werkstück poliert oder vielleicht auch ein Sonarpendel reinigt. Aber ein solcher Roboter müsste der nicht wissen, was er plant, eine Methodik zur Planung ausführen und zum Schluss zur Qualitätsüberprüfung. Und genau darum geht es. Und um dies zu erforschen, war Herr Leitner schon bereits während dieser Zeit in Bremen am Projekt der Realisierung des humanoiden Roboters Rolling Justin beteiligt, der am DLR realisiert wird. Und das ist ein Roboter, der in Zukunft eben einer ist, der, der ähm, ja, bei ähm, Konzepten wie realen Weltraummissionen mit dabei sein könnte und könnte dort als Anwendungsbeispiel in der Internationalen Raumstation genau solche Aufgaben in einer nachgebildeten Umgebung übernehmen. Ja, bei so einem spannenden Thema ist es natürlich nicht verwunderlich, dass Herr Leitner mehrere Preise bekommen hat für seine Promotion, den Preis der Helmholtz Gesellschaft für die beste Promotion, aber auch der Europäischen Robotik, des Europäischen Robotik Forums 2018. Und schließlich ist ihm dann eine Stelle als Gruppenleiter am DLR angeboten worden. Und das leitet er seit 2018, die Gruppe für fehlertolerante Autonomiearchitekturen am Institut für Robotik und Mechatronik des DLR. Hier ist auch seine Nachwuchsgruppe angesiedelt für fehler- und unsicherheitstolerante universelle Roboter. Ja, und dieses wollen wir uns jetzt genauer anschauen. Und wie die Roboter der Zukunft aussehen könnten, wenn sie nicht mehr nur Werkzeuge sind, sondern vielleicht intelligente, robuste Kollegen oder Kolleginnen für die Raumfahrt. Herr Leiner, ich bitte Sie jetzt, uns etwas mehr darüber zu berichten, aber vorher bekommen Sie auch Ihre Urkunde. Ja, kommen Sie schon mal vor. Ich lese jetzt auch nochmal die Urkunde vor. Die Stiftung Werner von Siemensring lädt auf Vorschlag der Deutschen Gesellschaft für Luft- und Raumfahrt, Daniel Leitner, 
als Jungwissenschaftler zu ihren Veranstaltungen ein und gibt damit die Möglichkeit zum wissenschaftlichen Gedankenaustausch mit den Mitgliedern des Stiftungsrats. Die Auszeichnung erfolgt in Anerkennung seiner herausragenden Arbeit zu KI-gestützter Telerobotik und deren Anwendung in der Raumfahrt, der Pflegeassistenz und der Pandemiebekämpfung. Herzlichen Glückwunsch. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction. It's a great honor. I will also present in English to not dance out of the line. And um, Thank you very much for um, having me here. So this presentation will be about resilient robots for a resilient society. But in fact, um, this work originates from a completely different world domain. It originates from, from this picture, from this vision, the colonization of Mars, the scientific um, exploration of the planet with humans. And these humans, these astronauts, they require some infrastructure in place. They require some habitats, they require energy, they require also communication infrastructure. And without that infrastructure in place, the astronauts can actually not live there. And so our idea to set up this infrastructure is to send robots, such as the on-ground or the, the on-ground assistance robot rolling just in here. But we would not send them alone. Because if you want to control a robot on Mars, it takes 20 minutes there to get a signal there, and it also takes 20 minutes back. So we would send instead, we would also send astronauts into the orbit of the planet, and they could control the robot from an orbiting spacecraft. They would be much, more, much faster and they would be much more efficient. And while this is yet um, not achieved, we have simulated it using the International Space Station. And in this video, you can see Alexander Gerst. He is in the Columbus module using our interface here, um, where he can easily command the robot on ground by a mere click on the tablet interface. And this is just an on ground. And he receives the command. They are high level, such as opening a door, um, grasping a solar panel, or in this case, trying to grasp this um, damaged module in order to prevent some failure. The robot itself is actually mostly autonomous. It is only receiving the commands and everything else is done by the robot itself. So now you might think, OK, how does that now help society? And about two years ago, actually, um, you all know that we had the pandemic started. And then we thought, OK, what, what can we do? And we talked to many different peoples. and. Um, from, for example, I talked to Dr. Andreas Kurt, head of the High Biosafety Laboratory at the Robert Koch Institute, and he told me, you know, High Biosafety Laboratories are just like the space station. They are confined spaces, and you need to wear these suits over here, so we could really use some robots there. And then I went to the Helmholtz, and we started actually this Covipa project with many colleagues from immunology, virology, and we visited the lab, so this is a DSL 3 lab. You cannot go inside with the camera because then it needs to stay inside. So therefore, you may have a look at this lab. It's at MDC in Bremen, but it looks essentially the same. Um, it just has no airlock. So we went there and we looked what we could do, and we figured that for the pandemic, maybe what could be done is PCR tests. And this is what you can see over here. So this is a robot that could do that, handling centrifuges, operating a PCR cycler, um, using or um, in, inserting the micro -teter plates over here, centrifuging the, the samples, and so on. And this is not the only situation in which a robot could be helpful, because if you think about elderly care, this is also um, 
a topic where robots are now um, actually demanded because if you minimize contacts, you actually um, are able to maybe um, save some lives because of you can uh, avoid spreading the virus. And just like we have seen it on the space station, we have the opportunity here to use the same interfaces and control the robot, the same robot, Justin, in another environment, in the home environment. And just as easy as it was before, you can just click on the tablet and the robot would do what you want. But at some point, you may want to interact with the human and then probably it's better if you are actually engaging directly. And so therefore we also use haptic pillar presence as you can see it here. So the operator now feels the force as the robot does and it can give the medication just as a medical person would be on place. So now it would be great if we would actually already have that. But I can tell you that um, there's quite some steps to go because robots are not perfect, as you can see over here. So robots make failure. They uh, make errors and they result from faults. So there may be actually an internal fault, thinking about a damaged system, a camera. There may be external faults, like the reflection on the object it could actually cause that problem. These faults result in errors, like a poor localization of the object in the hand, and eventually these errors lead to failure, so the robot fails to pour in here these balls, which may actually be liquid in a home environment. So, so what is required for a robot to deal with these events is that it has to detect the faults or the error, it has to adapt its actions, and only this way it is able or can be able to succeed and be a help for society. So this is where the research actually um, starts. And these are the four points that we are going to see right now. This is what you need if you want to send robots into your home. First of all, a robot needs to be able to reason about error, even before actually moving. It also needs to detect errors while it's executing a task. It needs to learn from errors, previous errors, and it needs to recover from them. So let's have a look at the first one. So this is what the internal model of the robot looks like. So it's its planning model. And if the robot is tasked now to use this brush in order to clean the spreadboard, the obvious solution is a two-step task. It's actually grasping the brush and start cleaning. Well, it seems obvious for a human, but for a robot, it's actually not, because if the robot would just grasp the brush like that, without any further in-hand manipulation, it would not be able to do so, because the brushes are upside down and it cannot clean. So the robot has to come up with alternatives, reasoning about potential failure. It needs to figure out that maybe it's a good idea to actually use the other hand, plan a handover action, and then it is able to actually do that planning, do that execution. How does that work? So our robots, they all work with action templates. An action template decides on two levels what to do. The first one is the semantic level. So the robot needs to know what the environment looks like, what an action actually requires for preconditions, and what the effect will be here, for example, the cleaning. In the second state, the robot needs some geometric reasoning. It needs a uh, digital version of its environment and it needs to use that in order to plan the motion with respect to the desired task. And here many different um, reasoning steps can come in like control, um, simulation of elements and things like that are required. The second part is about the detection of errors once the robot is executing that task. So now you can see here the robot is executing exactly that motion that was pre-planned beforehand in the um, digital version. Oh, so sorry, no worries. So you can see that in this situation, I'm actually annoying the robot. I go there and I disturb it. I lift the arm, and the task of the robot is here now to identify whether it was performing the task well or not. And you can see here that um, there's a discrepancy in the force and the position of the end effect or of the arm, and this information can be used to actually update the internal digital twin model. It may be a very simple model, but this is already enough for the robot to reason about where it actually performed well and where it failed to do so. And now um, I want to show you how a digital twin works for a robot. So you can see on this side, um, initially the robot needs some 
symbolic information like uh, where is my object on the table? Do I have something in the hand? Um, which surface is dirty and not whatsoever? And this information can then be transferred into a physics simulation environment, as you can see it over here. And if the robot is now mirroring the same motion that is executing in the real world to the simulation, it can predict what may go wrong and how to actually achieve the effect. So it may be actually that this box here falls over or that it is ending up at the desired position. And physics simulations are difficult, so they are never accurate. They are models. The model is never the reality. And um, this is all the more crucial for robots because this is their only way to identify what they did or not. If, okay, they cannot use vision, but if you, want to, if you want to predict things, they need some kind of mental model. And you can, can use the, just the simulation, as you can you see it over here. The robot will grasp that ball and, or at least try it, put it into that container. And if you only use simulation, manipulating objects that are round and as delicate as that ball and with the fingers that the robot has here, there's always um, miss simulations and things will happen like the ball will be lost. Some researchers use some um, heuristics, such as, yeah, once the robot is touching the ball, it's um, fixed to the hand, and then the robot can solve the problem by that means. But also here, um, you can see down here, the rigid binding solves some problems, but not all of them. And so I, our idea is actually a hybrid approach. In the back, you see that the robot at some point tries to grasp the object, and then it disappears. But it only disappears from that one simulation. There are multiples in the background, different ones, specialized, um, that are, for this example here, focused on in-hand localization. And once the robot is opening the hand again, the other physics simulation, which is perfectly fine for manipulating flying things or exploding things because it's actually a game engine, um, it, it does the job and, and makes, it, uh, makes a much better result here. Um, and this is only one kind of failure. And the robot will, in his lifetime or in his lifetime, will identify several different failures. So you here again see the, the example of that ball dropping experiment here. Um, for simplification, it's the same one, and you can see here the robot needs to grasp the ball over here, brings it, bring it over this container, and just drop it. And there's already a difference between the hands, and we can even make it worse. So we tested if the robot would be able to identify whether one of the hands is more effective than the other. So we, uh, we, 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 we actually damage one of the fingers, and so the, the slippage is, um, is much higher, and the ball would, with the left hand, um, occasionally fall out of the hand. And if you now collect all the information from how well was it with the right hand with the left hand, you can use that in the planning that I showed you in the very beginning, and the robot can exploit that. So it can exploit that, oh yeah, okay, maybe, maybe it's a good idea to grasp this ball with the other hand. So, but in order to reach that, the robot needs to um, shift everything to the other side of the workspace, so it's grasping the ball then from the other side, which potentially also may increase failure possibility, but in this case, actually, um, because the right hand um, is so much better in grasping the object, it is able to execute the task more resilient. And so you could now use only the likelihood for one of these experiences, um, but you will see that um, it's, it's quite easy. So you can just look at opening a drawer, how often does it fail, how often is it successful, and can use that as a means for computing your um, success probability. But as we are in different domains here, we can actually use information from different uh, sources, like um, opening a drawer in our space domain is not so much different from opening our drawer in the um, healthcare domain. And so therefore we try to connect the two um, domains, connect the knowledge, and this will give us a better, um, better estimation of how well can a robot of that class actually open a drawer or not or do any other task. And again, the digital model is key. The semantic information is from the digital um, twin. So we do not need to tell the robot, well, this was okay, this was not okay. No, all the time the robot's executing something. We repeat it in simulation. And if we have the good models, we can identify whether it went wrong or right. Now, the last part is about recovering, and this is actually the most complicated one. Considering that you have a simulation that can tell you every single state that may appear once the robot is executing with the environment, um, that would be enough actually to deal with most of the false cases. 
But if you look around to the robots that are already in place there, you will immediately find situations where this is not applied. And one prominent example is actually the Curiosity rover. And the Curiosity rover on Mars is actually um, running marathons there. So it's um, up there since more than 10, I think it's even like, yeah, this must be more than 10 years now. And um, you can hardly see, but only already after 546 saw, which are Mars days, the robot had some tiny holes in the wheels. And it got worse over time. So you can see here the light shining through. And it got even worse, like after almost two years. And the NASA, ex the NASA engineers, they thought, okay, if we do not take any action, what will happen? And they simulated it in their Mars yard. And um, so after only eight kilometers, there was a devastating damage to the wheel. And so they had to come up with something because the source of the damage is actually small rocks that pierce through the wheels. So what the, what the engineers did is actually they, 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 they were raising now the, the awareness for these hazards to their drivers by providing them information from satellite data, providing them more information from hazard camps. They would plan more carefully where they go because now obviously they want to go to the shark box and investigate them, but they should also avoid them, driving over them. So they implemented a force monitoring um, structure that allows them to identify um, using the wheel current whenever they were touching such a difficult rock, such a dangerous rock, and then stop or maybe even retreat. And then they did a massive exercise here in testing if their strategies would work. So every 500 meters, they would go down with the camera and now sweep underneath the, the car or the rover and look into the wheels and see if they were damaged or not, or if the, the severity got, or if it got more severe or not. And luckily this helped. So now this is like the data from January. Um, you can see it over here. We are almost about um, 27 kilometers here and more than 3,000 days on the Mars. And the robot is still operating. How does that help? So how can we get there? And this is the now the final question, what's, what's ongoing research because here, if, if not before already, because you know robotics is highly interdisciplinary, um, here it gets really interdisciplinary because these skills here, these actions, creating awareness, planning, monitoring, evaluation, is what is considered in human as metacognition. So metacognition means that a human can step back from its decisions and decide on error recovery strategies, on strategies to mitigate such situations by means of experience and other cognitive processes. And um, so, so this is what we will do in the future. We will explore these capabilities and try to transform them into software, into code, and bring them to the robots. And with that, I would like to end my talk. And um, thank you very much for having me one more time. So this is only part of my team. Um, this is actually that young investigator group. And, um, in name of them, I would like to thank you all and thank you very much. Yeah, vielen Dank, Herr Leitner, für diesen spannenden Vortrag, für den verschiedenen Einsatz von manuellen Robotern. Ja, ich schalte jetzt hier nochmal aus. Ja, meine Damen und Herren, nach diesen vier inspirierenden Vorträgen, denken Sie nochmal dran, welche Themen. Wir hatten Speicherung von DNA, neue Lösungen für grünen Wasserstoff, Fragen der besten Uhren weltweit, der genauesten Uhren oder jetzt zum Schluss humanoide Roboter. Denken Sie daran, dass Sie nur Fragen stellen können nach Abschluss der Veranstaltung. Aber bevor ich wir die Veranstaltung beenden und zu diesem schönen Teil des Empfangs übergehen, will ich mich nochmal bedanken. Einerseits sozusagen bei der guten Seele der Stiftung Werner von Siemensring, nämlich dem dort hinten sitzenden Herrn Fischer Wohlfahrt, der hier sehr viel organisiert hat, dem Sie diese ähm, Büchlein zu verdanken haben, der alles an der Stiftung tut, damit wir auch hier sitzen können, diese Preise verliehen, verleihen wir. Also vielen Dank, Herr Fischer Wohlfahrt, dass Sie das alles organisieren. Und dann natürlich auch vielen Dank nochmal für das max planck institut dass wir hier sein dürften, dass wir auch Führung erhalten haben und dass wir auch die schönen Räume nutzen können. Ja, wir freuen uns natürlich, dass 
ein bisschen was auch von dem Institut auch weiter uns beschäftigt bei der Stiftung Werner von Siemens Ring, wenn nämlich Herr Hell im Dezember, am 13. Dezember, dann seinen Ring erhält. Und wir freuen uns darauf schon, auch, dass wir uns dann mit diesem Institut und mit den Protagonisten wiedersehen. Ja, bis es soweit ist, lade ich Sie nun ein. An liebe Gäste, leider nur die, die hier präsent sind. Das ist der Vorteil einer Präsenzveranstaltung für die im Stream. Die müssen selbst jetzt ein bisschen feiern. Ja, ich lade Sie jetzt zu einem Empfang hier draußen ein, bei dem Sie jetzt alle Fragen stellen können, die Ihnen sicher unter den Nägeln brennen und sich mit den jungen Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftlern ganz im Sinne der Stiftung vernetzen können. Ich wünsche Ihnen also viele kurzweilige Gespräche, Spaß am Austausch und mit dem letzten Ratschlag von Werner von Siemens will ich dann enden. Das hat er an seinen Bruder gegeben. Habe immer die Zukunft vor Augen, denn darum kommt es in erster Linie an. Vielen Dank und viel Spaß beim Empfang. Und draußen bei dem Empfang diskutieren.